see what we are doing today. Um, today we are going to talk about, we're going to sort of finalize some things about um, database operations, namely inserts, updates, and deletes, and we'll talk about a few things. Now, some of the things, depending on time, we might go to a greater or less degree, but my aim is to sort of get you to thinking in that direction so that if you do need to do something like this on your project, you kind of have a good idea of where to, where to start and, and where to, where to uh, proceed on it. So um, that's where we are um, headed at today. Um, I probably should have gone into Canvas like last night before I left. Um, so it would have been up to the login page by now, but hopefully... <laughs> I always, I just I, got I, it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's too early to turn up. My, my ex-wife had a class where if someone's phone went off, they had a quiz. What? So, <laughs> aren't you glad that you have a teacher oh, that yeah. brings you donuts instead <laughs> of has <laughs> stupid rules like that? Yes. I mean, my I phone has gone off during, uh, during class. What would I do then? Okay. Give myself? someone might take the videos and edit it. It's like, I would love if someone remixed my <laughs> lectures, you know? As long as they didn't like, do something like really vile to them, I would, I would love it if someone did that. You are encouraged to, you know? So anyhow. Um, so you like an animated version. Yeah, right, right. But I, I mean, I just don't get it. I mean, you know, there's people that say that their syllabus constitutes intellectual property. It's like, they must have a heck of a lot better syllabus than me. Because <laughs> I wouldn't call my syllabus intellectual anything, you know? I mean, it's a syllabus, right? It tells you what we're going to do when. It, it, it's not like, I don't know, plans to the Death Star or something, you know? Anyhow. That's how Huffman treats his labs, because he's like watermarks all that stuff at the bottom. Ooh, he like, okay. All the Twitter information. He said because somebody like stole something or something? Something like altered his lab or something? <laughs> And now from that, from that on, everything has, like, the um, date and, like... <laughs> I have no comment on that issue. <laughs> um, I, you know, if someone's used my life, fine. I, it's an honor, right? I mean, I mean, if you sell it and make money off of it, then, okay, maybe we need to talk. <laughs> but, you know, if it's just, like, another teacher using it, you know, it's like, why not, you know? Oh, well. I, oh, never mind. <laughs> no comment. All right, so the one thing that we're going to talk about is we've seen a details view in edit mode, and we've seen a details view in insert mode. And I have to look and review, because I, I, it was a long weekend and all, and I don't 100% remember. But I think we essentially had the same details you duplicated. Um, I'll have to look to see if that's the case. If not, we'll 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 talk about that and we'll we'll um, go forward. Um, I have to see what pages we have again, assuming Visual Studio ever fires off. But one thing we might want to do is we might want to have the same page that works either in details view or insert view, depending on the circumstances. 
Think of, for example, the, the, the summer league baseball example we had. We had a page um, where a player could edit their information. All right? And um, you would need a page for them to register their information the first time as well. Well, if you think about it, those two pages are essentially the same page. They have, you know, the ability to insert versus edit is the same thing, more or less. All right? So you don't want to duplicate that effort. You don't want to do uh, everything over twice. You know, you'd be best off having one page. That way, it, you know, if you added a field or something, you know, you would you would have it only in one place, and you wouldn't have to go and, and duplicate it across a couple of places. Now, you would have to go in and duplicate the template columns. That's the one thing that's a little bit goofy, but um, you know. It's a small price to pay for, for it doing um, all the stuff that it does do for you. It's kind of like, you know, if you don't like that, you can always code it yourself, right? And then you have complete control over it. So when you look at these this built-in functionality, again, sometimes there's limitations. And as I said before, you have the option then of do you sort of tweak the build-in to sort of... Um, you know, um, work exactly the way that you want it to or as close to exactly the way you want it to as possible? Or do you just say, well, forget it then. I'm going to code it all myself. So that's your choices when you're dealing with this. So let's look at what we had and refresh our memory a bit before we go on. We do. We have, we have two pages that are essentially the same. We have a register page. like this. And then we have a player info page that looks like this. All right. As we switch between them, has some template columns, it's virtually the same. SQL data source, details view. Um, the only difference is, is there's a couple template columns on the edit page that, that aren't there on the insert page because we didn't have the time to do those. So that's that's a redundancy, right? And that's something that is, is duplicated effort. So you wouldn't want to um, you wouldn't want to you wouldn't want to do it in this manner. All right. You could do it in this manner, but again, if something were to change, there's two places to change it. All right. What's the difference between the player info page and the register page? Both of them <coughs> maintain the player table. All right. But what's the difference beyond that? The register table adds to the right. One does an insert. One does an update. What about from a, a GUI perspective? If I go into each of those pages, what will I what will I visually notice that is different about them? And again, this might be so obvious that that it's confusing, right? right the with the, would be yeah, the register page starts with a blank slate, and the uh, edit page starts with this stuff pre-populated. So let's go in. I actually forget. Actually, forget who I have in here. I think I have like an MZ and password. Okay.
So if I go to the register page, we'll check all the things that are different. The one thing that's different again is it's a blank page. There's, there's nothing in any of the fields because we're inserting a brand new person. All right? The other thing is our options are insert and cancel. If we go to the player information page by logging on, <coughs> our options are update and cancel and we have some template columns for like the drop down for example showing um, that all right so one of the things that we talked about is that these detailed views exist in a mode all right so conceivably we could use this player info page both for the insert and for the update all right. We would just need to put it in a different mode. All right. Now, if you look on the player info page, you'll notice that the mode for it default mode is set to edit view. All right. If we look back at the register page and looked at the default mode is insert. <clears throat> so that's one difference between these is that the insert mode um, or, or the, the register page has an insert mode uh, as a default. The other one has edit as a default. So we need to be able to, if we, if we want to use the player input page both for the registration page and for the edit page, we have to know what mode we want to put the user in. Because if they're registering, we want to put them in insert mode. If they are editing uh, an existing person, we want to put them in edit mode. How can that, and again, Think back to the first or second week of classes, all right? We saw how we can manipulate, like, any property of an ASP.NET control, right? And the default mode is a property, right? So we can manipulate that via our code. We can have it set up one way, and then we can change that based on something in our code, all right? How are we going to tell if we are in, if we want to put this, what's going to be our criteria, though, to set that property? How are we going to know if we want to go into default mode or register mode? One way we could do it, we could actually do it a couple different ways. One way we could do it, well, now that I think about it, there probably is only one way to do it, all right, in, in this particular case. In other cases, there might be other ways. All right, um, but in this case, we'll know by the session mode, right? If they're logged in, they're not registering, so therefore, we're going to put them in edit mode. If they are not logged in, then they're not registered yet, or they're not logged in yet, so we put them in register mode. So we can conditionally go and we can change this details view to be either in insert mode or in um edit mode based on the value of the session variable. Now, let me back up for a second to where my confusion started when I said there was a couple ways to do it. In other cases, the determining factor would be whether there's something on the query string or not. If you remember, like if we pick way back when we picked uh, something from one screen and went and viewed the details of it on another page. We could go into edit mode based on whether there was something on the query string or not. So we could use any number of different criteria to determine whether they should be in input mode or whether they should be in edit mode. All right, insert versus edit mode, that is. So in this particular case, we're going to be using the query string. But in other cases, we'd look to see if there's something on the query string. So if there's an ID on the query string, all right, we would want to go into edit mode because we already have a row that we want to do something with. 
If there's nothing on the query string, then we don't have a row that we want to do something with, and therefore we would go into insert mode. So it depends on the particular problem what criteria you'd use. But essentially, no matter what, there's going to be some criteria, or there should be, and if not, you'll make one, all right, some criteria that will say, hey, in this instance, I want to be in insert mode, in this instance, I want to be in edit mode. So let's look at our player info page, and let's look at the code behind for this, and we'll notice that we're already looking for the session ID. And in this case, if there's no session ID, we direct them to the login page. We want to change that functionality. So if there's no session ID, we want to leave them on this page, but we want to put them in insert mode. All right? So I should be able to do this. If session player ID equals null, I should be able to say, I don't want to redirect them, I simply want to change that details view. So details view one dot default mode equals where I wish IntelliSense would help me. Because <laughs> it's not telling me what I want to put in there. <clears throat> so we'll Google it. So, again, one trick in is learning, like, the proper keywords here. So, you know, Google or any resource like that can, can help you find your answer quickly if you look for it the right way. So in this case, I want to say um, ASP.NET change details view default mode. And I cannot type. It is. Thank you. All right. I was just going to say, uh, here is where we can go to the Microsoft page and get volumes and volumes and volumes, and somewhere in there it might be the answer. <laughs> or we could go to Stack Overflow. And, and have someone yell at us and <laughs> give us the wrong answer. Well, it's the right one. It's just the long one. <laughs> well, yeah, it, it depends. So we have our choices. Pick your poison, as they say. Still in between. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So this tells us that is an enumeration. Does everyone know what enumeration is? An enumeration is where you have a property that can only get certain values. So for example, the, 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 the default mode for a details view. There's only three choices, right? It's either read only, insert, or edit. That's the only three choices. There's not like a, um, I don't know, pick a fourth thing. There's not like a, you know, view part of the detail view or um, show it if you have security privileges or something like that. There's only three defined possible values for this. So usually what they do is they create something called an enumeration. And an enumeration usually is just a, like an integer or something. But you give that integer a name so that it's easy to remember. Because 
It says here that the default is details view mode dot read only. That probably translates to some integer. That probably is like maybe zero, for example. And maybe insert is one and maybe edit is two. But I don't, it, it's tough enough remembering the name of the enumeration, let alone if I also had to memorize the numbers that belong to each thing. So, usually they start out with the name of the property that you are trying to change, and then if you do the dot, it will give you the possible values. So, details... that again. Detail view mode. Alright. And there it shows us these three values. So, if the player ID is null, that means that they have not logged in. Which means we want to put them in insert mode. And again, that probably, when the day is done, translates into a number, but it would be tough to remember all the specific numbers. So, therefore, they, they give an enumeration like this. Okay, now let's run this. And I'm first going to go into Player's Info. I'm going to set it as a start page. And we're going to go to Player's Info without <coughs> logging in. And sure enough, we get insert mode. Um, there is one thing I forgot to do, though. All right, I put the details view in insert mode, but I didn't tell it that inserting was possible. That's sort of a paradox, I know. But right, you know, yeah, you can insert, but the, the data, the details view doesn't know that you can insert, so it doesn't give you the the links. So I can go in here and simply say. Enable insert, which I can't do. Why can't I do that? There's enable editing, but there's, pardon me? I don't have an insert statement, right. It's amazing how clever this, the framework is in some respects, but how unclever it is in other respects. Like, why did it let me put in insert mode, though, if I couldn't possibly insert? Why didn't it blow up? But, hey, what the heck, this is the price you pay when you let someone else do some of your work for you, right? I mean, I could imagine ASP.net, if we were going to personify it for a second, throwing up its arms and saying, well, you don't like how I did it? Do it yourself, you know, and write all the code custom yourself. And that is an option if the way that ASP.net does it is radically different from when you want it. But in this case, it's like, okay, I'll write the insert statement myself, you know. And we can go in here and... I can actually copy the insert statement for this guy, I believe. And simply put it in here. question because if I answer yes to this, it will go in and it will uh, delete all your template fields, right. If I answer no to that, you run the risk of confusing it and breaking it. So this is a... <laughs> uh, well, I had a question about this in the lab. Okay. I have all these fields and like I need to hit yes, but if I do then everything goes away and then Marshall gets sad. So... <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, um, 
Are you planning a career in professional wrestling such that you are referring to yourself in the third person? Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyhow, I'm going to answer no. And I'll tell you why I'm answering no. I haven't, like, added any tables or any columns here. I just... There, it, ASB down is being cautious here. It knows I changed something, so it thinks that it could be a problem. So I'm going to say, nah, I'm going to give it a shot. Not right. Yeah. All right. So now, let's go and run this. I did a back to this freak out. I think we were working on the clip now. Oh. Enable inserting. Now I can. All right. I was going to say, why doesn't that work? But now I can. And you know, you know that, that, that every time that something like that happens, there's probably an email sent to the coder of that that says, here, laugh at this guy in Olympia, Ohio, because he went through all this trouble and forgot to click enable inserting. And then he's puzzled and waits 30 seconds and then, all right, so let's go and do this. So now we have our insert and cancel, and this looks exactly like the registration page. Now do notice that the template columns that I created for edit mode aren't here. Because really that's a different template. There's an insert template and there's an edit template. I can't imagine a case of where I would want the edit and insert template to be different. All right? So like if there's a drop down in the insert, there should be one in the edit too, and vice versa. I can't imagine where in one case I'd want to use a drop down, and in the other case I'd want radio buttons, all right, or a text, you know, just a, a text field. But you have the flexibility to do that. Uh, again, if you're complaining about this, well, don't use a framework then, all right. And I, I think that um, for tasks that lend themselves to the framework. This is a small price to pay for all the other functionality you get. So, okay, you have to go and make two drop-downs instead of one. At least those two drop-downs are on the same page, and you can share the data source and so on and so forth. So, it's not that big of a deal, all right? Even though it's a little annoying, a little frustrating for that. Now, if we've only done half the testing, though. Actually, we, not, we have not even done half the testing. We have not gone and tested to make sure that an insert actually works. All right. Um, so I'm not going to do that. But you should. All right. <laughs> Just in the interest of time. <laughs> now let's log on. And let's, do the, let's test the other scenario where we go to this page and we've set the session variable. All right, and that seems to work. So the same page we've gotten to work in two different modes. Question? So when you go to log in, say you messed up a password, mm -hmm. that's, well, that will not produce a null value. So it'll give you unsuccessful, it will produce a null value and take you to the make your own page. But you log in and you forgot your password. But you didn't type a password in. You just type in your username and hit log in. Well, it depends how you code. Okay. Right? Let's see how we've coded it. Because me personally, I don't if I like this method. I'd rather have like a new new user button, you know, mm -hmm. like that to bring to that page. Because how are they gonna know like oh if you leave a blank and you click this, you'll go to the new user. Oh, oh. Let let's make sure, let's be clear about what I'm demonstrating here. Absolutely there should be a new user link somewhere. All right. I just didn't go through the effort of doing this. I'm, I'm talking about just this particular operation. Gotcha. Your navigation would be different. You oh. would make a, you, you know, you would make a register login links on your home page, and you could even be smart enough to disable the one or the other depending on whether they're logged in or not. So if they're logged in, disable register. If they're not logged in, disable. Well, how would that go? <laughs> you, you, you know,
know what I mean now. You, you could change login to edit information right. or whatever. You could you could view and hide that. So I'm just talking about the page itself, the navigation that you would use to get to this page. Yeah, what the what you're saying is 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 clearly better. Okay. All right. Um, I know what's going to happen, and I'm already going to. I'm already getting ready to start making excuses for myself. <laughs> <laughs> what's going to happen is it's going to it's going to blow up. Right. Uh, and there you go. You just wanted to see it. Yeah, you just wanted to see it. Get me admit that. Yeah, just I thought it was going to, so I wasn't sure like if it was going to work. You know. What should it do? It should, um, it, there should be validation for that. I think I have validation for, oh, just say continue. I think I have validation if you omit the user ID. Yeah, yeah. I just didn't put it in for the password. Okay. All right. At this point, to try to maintain some dignity, I will like roll my eyes and very exasperated say, look, do I have to do everything? <laughs> <laughs> or, or alternately, look, I brought you guys donuts. Do I have to like fill in every oh. detail? Yeah, there's donuts there. Oh, man. Yeah. Right. Once it's all is in multiple mouth. Right. <laughs> Little too much information, but that's okay. What? <laughs> all right. Uh, okay. Um, let's see. Questions about this approach? I will say, and again, this is a case of, and I hate to do it, but do as I say, not as I do. I did not test this thoroughly enough. I tested like, I did like the first half of the testing. In other words, I went in and saw that the screens worked. I did not actually go in and go in and try to insert someone, go in and try to edit someone and actually click the insert and cancel and all that. All right. Now, some people will say, well, of course that would work. You didn't touch anything dealing with the, and it's like, no, no. You know, if I had a, 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 a penny for every time a developer told me, you know, back when I was working uh, in software development, a lot of times I would mentor some of the younger developers and they would always say the same thing. It's like, well, I didn't touch that part of the code, and it's like, it doesn't matter. It's like, <laughs> you know, it's like you open up your iPhone, if you can even open them up, I don't know, but you, <laughs> you, know, you open up your TV, or you open up your, your Android device, or whatever, it's like, the warranty's gone, man, right? You got to go back and test it to make sure that it works. So, you mess with anything in the programming, in a program, you need to go back and do what's called regression testing. Because it's not always obvious how things connect. All right? And, you know, one of those things that, like, it blew up. I don't get it. I don't get it. Then when you finally do find a problem, it's like, oh, okay. All right. That makes sense. So, really, even if there's a piece of code that was functioning before, it pays to test it again. Even if you made a change that you don't think relates to the particular piece of functionality. All right. Let's put it this way. It's probably theoretically possible to over and under test software, but in my experience I have never ever seen anyone over test software. So you're probably not going to be the first person to over test software. So you're probably like everyone else in the world and your natural tendency is to under test it. So your natural tendency, my natural tendency, Bill Gates' natural tendency, everyone's natural tendency is to under-test because it's really tough. There's so many, and again, when, you know, things grow exponentially with software. You know, when you consider every if statement you have doubles the possibilities of what could happen in your code. All right. So you know, you start getting, you know, you've heard the old uh, old trick. You know, you usually get like kids with this, like. 
what would you rather have? A dollar a day, every day for a year? Or I'll give you one penny on the first day, and then two pennies on the sec second day, and third penny or four pennies on the third day, and so on down the line. Which would you rather have? And usually, little kids are like, oh, I'll take the dollar a day, you know. <coughs> well, no, because two to the three hundred and sixty-fifth power is like a really big number. All right, we'll have to ask Jesse what that value would be, because I'm, I'm sure he probably Please has. Don't. Yeah. Um, but anyhow, yeah, when you, when you start doubling things, that's an exponential increase. So instead of a nice linear increase, you have an exponential. So the more if statements that you add to your code, the possibilities that you get become crazy. And you have to really test very thoroughly to make sure that you haven't broken anything, even if the change you make seems very, very innocent. Yes? So right now, like, with... The way, so beginning workflow for a soft, software developer is just, right now my workflow is write a line of code or edit a column and then open it up and test it to make sure that it works. But it seems like it's dragging on. That's just the normal workflow to I start getting in the mind frame of I know this works or should that continue? Um, the way you're describing it sounds pretty okay to me. Um, the, the only thing I would say would be that when you're done, now you don't have to do this every single time, but when you're done, go in and make sure that you didn't affect something you didn't think of. Like, let, let's take an example. Let's say I have a real simple, straightforward Fahrenheit to centigrade conversion. I, it's like an example I'm doing almost every class. I don't know if I, maybe I didn't do it this term because I was bored with that one, but whatever. You have a very simple like conversion. And let's say that there was a bug in the centigrade to Fahrenheit conversion, and it was your job to fix it. So you go in and you look at it and you play around with the code and you figure out that someone has a parentheses in the wrong place or whatever. So you go in and you change the parentheses, you'd run it through the test, make sure that it worked. Alright? Even though you don't think that you changed the section of code, I'd go back and do just to be sure, the other conversion, mm -hmm. the Fahrenheit to centigrade, all right? Just to be sure that there wasn't something small that... And you do be. that to this day. Oh, absolutely. Saying. Okay. Yeah, that. yeah absolutely. Uh, yeah. Uh, now, there, there's a couple disclaimers here. You know, I, I, can speak, I can speak from a perspective of a professor, and I can speak as a prof uh, perspective as a developer, all right? Um, if it's a case of I am literally just changing a label on a page or something like that, it's like, well, okay, I'll take the risk that that has some unexpected consequence, you know. Um, but if there's anything with the functionality, yeah, I'll, I'll go back and, and, and retest. Um, the one thing that, that, that does change over time is you mentioned, like, and again, I'm not sure if you meant it like literally or if you were just, you know, if you, if you were just speaking in general terms. But if you make, you know, maybe the chunks of what you test become a little bigger. So maybe you don't test after every literal every line, line change, but maybe you do three or four line changes, mm -hmm. test it. Four, you know, four or five more, test it, and so on. So as you get more confident... It with, has been. It's right. been about like a quarter of whatever function, I mean, right. project I'm trying to do. Right. Or whatever right then on the web page. About a quarter through, I'll go through and start testing. Or a a absolutely. Or and, and I think that's, that's a great approach from, from a lot of perspectives. Um, it's a great approach um, because, first of all, you know, just, you know, speaking in very general terms, if you have 100 lines of code and there's a problem in it, there's 100 possible lines that could be wrong. Whereas if you do 25 lines of code and there's a problem with it, there's only 25 lines that could be wrong, right? So that makes it, one, you know, should cut your debugging time substantially. Then if you add 25 lines more and it doesn't work, I won't say absolutely, but it's probably the new stuff you added. Unless there was sort of a hidden problem in the first 25 lines that maybe didn't come out until later on. So that's a possibility, but there's a good chance that if everything was working at this point, you add a few lines of code, 
those are probably the guilty guilty party causing of the problems. So yeah, um, it, it's good from a from a, 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 a speed of debugging process that again you're not looking for an error amongst a big chunk of code, but you're looking you're isolating and able to look at uh, a little section of it. It's good just from your attitude, you know. Um, when you leave, you know, like let's imagine you're working an eight-hour shift and you leave for the day. It's nice to have something 100% working, even if it's only 10% of your your assignment. Right? It's better to do that than to have 100% of your assignment 90% working, because 90% working means, unfortunately, in the world of programming, not working, right? So it's better to have, okay, I'm not doing everything, but the stuff I'm doing is, is good, and it works, and, and so on. So the approach that you described is good from that perspective as well. So yeah, that sounds pretty, with, with slight variances, yes, that's probably the way to go. And again, it is painstaking, but remember, <coughs> Zeller's famous curve here, I didn't invent this, but further along in a project that you detect an error, the cost skyrockets. And again, it's exponential. It's not simply that it gets more expensive. It gets more expensive at a increasing rate. So, if you do, if you notice a bug when you are planning your code, doesn't cost much expense, doesn't take much expense to correct it. If you are building testing, yeah, it goes up a little bit. If you have implemented your code, and you have to go back and fix an error, the cost is way up there. So anytime you can spend in this stage tracking down and catching errors and, and fixing and correcting them is time well spent. All right. Now this is a graph. <coughs> this was true like the first day someone wrote software. All right. And I don't know what they what they programmed on, you know, some giant mainframe as big as this building probably or whatever. And they probably programmed by putting wires around and all that. This was a true graph. And this graph is true today, and this graph will be true forever. All right? It's always going to be the case that the further on down the line you find a problem, the more expensive it is to correct it. Now what we try to do with good programming practices, all right, and and good design practices is flatten this out a little bit. So yeah, it's not so drastic. <coughs> so maybe a good programmer nudges that line down a little bit, all right? But it's still going up and it's still curving up. So it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. All right, great question. Um, this one thing that sometimes I regret not having more time to do I know in my Android class, I had I had people say, you know, even forgetting about like the the the, the material of the lecture, you know, you know what, what are some of your experiences in software development, you know, and all that. And I'm I'm always glad, you know, it, it, I'm always glad to go over them, you know. I mean, I think any old programmer or any old person in general, <laughs> if you ask them, like, you know, what was it like when you started, you know. Uh, driving a taxi, and it's like, well, I woke up in the morning, and I saddled up the horse, and, I, you know, and it's the same thing here, you know, it's like, well, I got my box of punch cards, and I started typing away, and, you know, blah, blah, blah. So, absolutely, um, again, this is something that experience has bared out, and not just for me, but for everyone else in the programming industry, you know, this is a very, very, very common sort of model. And if you think about it, it's no different than if you talk about building a, like a physical house or something, or building a physical structure, right? If you decide you want a room two feet bigger when it's still a sketch on, on a sheet of paper, yeah, that might cost you a little bit more, but it doesn't cost that much more, 
you know. If you are already living in the house and you decide you want your kitchen two feet bigger, your expenses have gone through the roof, pardon the pun. All right? Okay, other questions? Pardon me? It's about the Civil War. <laughs> about the Civil War, yeah. I got a question. Yes. Um, so like, uh, like white box texting and like black box texting, I, never, I don't really know like too much about that, but I know that that is a okay. valuable way of testing code. Okay. Is that something that we would learn ever in like a different class, too? Um, You might cover that in the systems class. I'm not sure. That, that's a great question. White box versus black box testing. What does that mean? All right. Um, it's kind of a mis misnomer to say white box versus black box. All right, because if you had something in a white box, you couldn't see the insides of it anymore if it was in a black box, right? You know, here's a white box. We close it up, what's in it? Well, we know there's donuts in it, so that's a bad example, all right? But let's say we didn't know what's don that there were donuts in there. Or, or let's, a better question, how many donuts are in there? Who knows? I don't know, we can't see that, right? If it was in a black box, it would be the exact same way. The better thing would be a, if I was going to suggest it, I would say a metal box versus a glass box. All right? What's the difference between if the donuts were in a metal box versus a glass box? A Met, uh, metal box you can't see through. A glass box you can see through. All right? So when you talk about black box versus white box testing, what they're really saying is, do you know what's going on inside the code? All right? Okay. Is the code transparent to you? So how does that have an impact? If you know what the code is, then you can write test cases to test to make sure that the code does what it's supposed to do. So for example, let's say that I know that there's an if statement in here that says if, you know, um, if um, the session variable isn't set, then set this property. All right. If I was doing white box testing, all right, I'd write my test case based on knowing that there's an if statement for that. Now, what would black box text, te testing be? Black box testing is where you don't care what's going on, but you know the behavior that you want. All right. What's the downside of both of them? The downside of both of them is that there's a potential with white box testing to verify that the program does, how do I want to put it? White box with white box testing, you run the risk of putting the cart before the horse, all right? And testing based on what the code says instead of testing based on what you know the result should be. It's almost like you're biased for what the program's doing. All right? In other words, I have an if statement to see if the employee's hours are greater than 40. So I'm going to write a test case that tests if the employee hours are greater than 40. Right? The black box testing would say, I know that if a person works this many hours, this is their paycheck. So did it work or not? All right? You don't know the formula for overtime. You don't care. You just know if I put these numbers in, did I get the output I wanted? All right? So they both have their advantages and disadvantages. The advantages of white box testing is it can help you pick out test cases you might have already missed. Like, oh, it matters if you're a student whether you're out of county or out of state. Gee, I better include that. With black box testing, you'd have to realize that, hey, the scenarios are, you know, that, you know, there's a test case for that if a student um, is out of, out of town or out of state and they take this many credit hours, this is what they get. Now, you might not know the formula by which they get that, you just know the results. So, I guess to summarize it, 
with white box testing or my glass box testing, um, you know the process and you test based on your knowledge of the process. Whereas in black box or metal box testing, um, you, um, you test based on um, knowing what the results ought to be without caring about what the process is. Either one of them can sort of shift your focus in one direction or another. Is that a good answer? Or? All right. Where'd you hear those terms, by the way? Just in conversation or in a class here? Or? Here you at Highland. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. I was like, uh, yeah. <laughs> right. Well, a lot of a lot of times, a, a lot of times when you refer when people refer to things as a black box, they're talking about um, you don't know anything about what goes on inside. In fact, a good function is supposed to be like a black box, right? A good function, if we had a function to calculate tuition, right? And let's say you were writing a web page to display the tuition charts here at LC, all right? If someone has already written that function, all right, and then they created an object or whatever, all you should have to do is supply the necessary inputs and you got your answer. And you don't care about what happened inside of it, right? It's like, well, I don't know what the formula is. I don't need to know the formula. Someone did that for me, all right? So good functions can be used as black boxes where you don't have to know what's going on. You just need to know the um, user inputs and the outputs. The reverse is also true for a black box, all right? That is, the innards of a technical term there, innards, all right, the innards of a black box doesn't know anything about the outside world. So, for example, getting back to the tuition calculation, um, the tuition calculation shouldn't depend on the fact that there's a text box on the page. That knows something about the outside world, right? Every information, every piece of information that that function needs should be given to it in the form of arguments. And the result should be outputted as a return value. Whether the tuition, uh, whether the, the number of credit hours came from a drop down or from a text box or from a database operation or what, shouldn't matter to the function. You just give that value to the function and it does its job and gives you the results. And what you do with that results, whether you write it on a bill or store it in a database or display it on a, in a label on the screen, that shouldn't matter also. So anytime they talk about black box anything, they're talking about you don't know what goes on inside of it, but you know what you give it and you know what you get out. And conversely, it doesn't know anything about the outside world. All right? Other questions? Okay, um, I will want to talk about something for a short time on Thursday, all right? So there, there's one, one more piece of the puzzle that I want to talk about on Thursday, but it should not take the entire class. So my aim will be to have a lot of time for you to work on your projects and any other assignments and get questions answered. As we wind down, um, feel free to send me emails. Feel free to make appointments to, um, you know, to, to talk to me. Like, I don't have a formal schedule next week, but, you know, you can arrange a, a meeting with me. You can also arrange a meetings with me on Skype if you want. That way, if you don't feel like driving in or whatever, um, we can Skype and do that. But, <laughs> again, uh, if you want to Skype me, just don't go online and look to see if I happen to be online and, and <laughs> drop in a phone call, which I've had students kind of do that before. It's like, these are like appointments. The only difference is, is uh, they're not physically in my office. We're meeting via Skype. So um, at any rate, because I mean, I'm, I'm typically not on Skype unless, number one, I'm frustrated with the way my phone works and I need to, need to call someone, which my touchpad wouldn't work on my phone, so anytime I want to use an automated system, I use Skype. So if I'm paying a bill, I don't want to be <laughs> getting uh, questions on ASP.net. Um, or I'm, I'm helping a student already, so make an appointment uh, for that. All right. Um, I do need a thumb drive. I forgot my thumb drive today. Largely because for the first time since the second week of semester, I think I'm wearing a different jacket today. So I have, uh, 
I need a volunteer from the studio audience. Could lights please? Yeah. Two. 